Hello there, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for the next hour, we're going to be talking about class and the church. Uh, there is obviously much more than we can cover in that time. So we'll be making a start on some of the key topics and also invite you watching at home or wherever you're watching to contribute your thoughts and questions so we can incorporate those too, if you'd like to. And you can do that um, through the chat box. Uh, there is also a virtual bookstore of relevant titles via the Church House Bookshop with books on offer. And there is also uh, a hashtag if you want to share any thoughts outside of the conversation, and that is hashtag church and class. So I'm going to waste no time because we only have an hour this evening introducing uh, the participants uh, tonight. So we have Father Azariah France Williams, Rector of Ascension, Ascension Church Hume, failed on the first attempt, <laughs> a member of Heart Edge Network and author of the Ghost Ship, Institutional Racism and the Church of England. Hello, Azariah. Hello. Uh, we have Reverend Lynn Collins, who's a parish priest in Stockport, Greater Manchester, and chair of the National Estates Church Network. She has represented NEC on a number of national strategic groups and is committed to influencing process of church reform so as to broaden participation and leadership. Welcome, Lynn. We have the Reverend Dr. Sharon Prentice, Canon Theologian for Litchfield Cathedral and Honorary Fellow of the Edward, Edward Cabri Centre for the Public Understanding of Religion, shortly to move to St. Melitus to be... To be the, Dean of Ministry Formation. The, dean of Ministry Formation. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you also for joining us. It's and we have the Right Reverend Philip North, Bishop of Burnley in the Diocese of Blackburn. Welcome. Also, nice to be with you. Uh, and I'm Vicky Walker. I am a writer, broadcaster, general commenter on matters of faith and culture and other things. And um, I am also someone with an interesting mix of class background. So that's why one of the reasons that why I'm hosting this conversation tonight, just to talk about the complexity of this and the variety of uh, issues that are still live and still very relevant for so many people. Uh, recent years have seen a real shift in how class is perceived and talked about. It's been said that the old distinctions between upper, middle and working class no longer hold true. And we now talk in new terms, the elite, the precariat and other newer categories, which are sometimes seen as being more accurate than pushing everyone into either working, middle or upper class. So I wanted to quickly just ask the panel as we started, how you perceive yourself in terms of class? Uh, let's start with Azariah. Hello there, thank you. So I guess I want to muddy the water a little and just uh, share a quick story of um, two um, uh, uh, white, uh, fairly uh, established uh, clergy people I spoke to about being on their teams at different points in ministry. And um, one of them worked really hard to ask me lots of questions about what school I went to, which university I went to, and it really felt as if they, they really, really wanted me to belong to a particular club that they were part of. Um, at another point in time, mm -hmm. I remember speaking to um, a leader who was thinking about being part of their team and, and saying, um, you know, something you need to know is that um, as, as a person, there are, um, uh, there are things within this institution which lower my voice, as a working class person um, and having that background, uh, sometimes in particular settings I'm more of a wallflower and don't quite know the nuances of conversations. And as someone who is dyslexic and dyspraxic, um, there are just some things that I just don't, I can't figure out how it all works. And he said, you know what, that's wonderful because as a church we need to have the richness of all of those things. And, uh, and so for me, um, class is bound up with, with a number of other things. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's me, that's my starter for 10. That's an excellent starter. Um, Lynn, how would you perceive yourself in terms of class? Um, I come from a working class background. Um, I've done the BBC class calculator um, that was a Mads article and I'm actually a new affluent worker. So it's somebody who comes from a working class background, who owns their own home, which I do, but I live in a rectory now, um, and is young. 
Um, so uh, two out of three ain't bad on that, really. <laughs> so, um, so I do come from a working class background and, and I've consciously inhabited that identity to act as a source of positive attrition on the church. That's how I would phrase it. So um, I said to somebody the other day, I kind of have become or did become a caricature of myself. I think actually, because definitions of class are so difficult and, and when you're from a working class background, um, I think others feel this too. The goalposts are moved all the time. Oh, you can't be working class, so you can't speak into that because there's always a reason why you can't um, be part of the narrative and the commentary on on the broader church and broader culture and those goals definitely change so um so i consciously several years ago claimed um kind of a, that um working class identity and brought that forward into what i did with the church largely because nobody listened and i saw issues of class um wherever i went and um, when i came forward in the discernment process it was announced in my church and one of the lay leaders who was a bloke um had his own business uh, sidled up to me and kind of um uh, said in quite a sinister voice what does somebody like you want from a game like this and and actually um you know it is it, it is a difficult environment for um working class um people in the church generally and working class leaders i think we've seen some of that on social media over the couple of last couple of days there's there's a great deal of hurt out there and and um and it's something that the church needs to address and i'm hoping later in the seminar to to say some of the ways i think it is being helpfully addressed but i think we do need to acknowledge that um so i'm apparently a new affluent worker from a working class back great uh sharon could you unmute yourself and tell us where you see yourself well i'm i'm very proud of my working class roots and I still consider myself as having working class roots, but being socialized into middle class culture through uh, the opportunities of education and, uh, and also the various jobs that I've done um, throughout my life. Um, we don't live in a meritocracy. <laughs> Which means that you 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 know it, it, it's it's uh, as Lynn and Azariah have described, there are certain characteristics that come together in an intersection. So as a black working class woman of migrant parentage from the north, having to navigate certain obstacles and divides, of which I am intensely proud of and which constitutes to some extent where I am today. So this idea and this notion of hybridity comes very much to the fore. And there are so, so many pressures, I think, to deny aspects of yourself in order to fit in and to conform. Um, and so um, as somebody who was a social activist in the community and a, an educator, um, and, and also, more importantly, as somebody that follows Jesus Christ, there is something about being affirmed in the image of God that I feel is really vital that the church should be speaking into. Um, and how do we acknowledge the way that people have been alienated and marginalised and ostracised by the very institution of God? Thank you, Sharon. Um, Philip, could I ask you to ask that question as well? I'll do my best. Um, I, it's, I mean, social class is indefinable, but um, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And uh, it's, it's almost a test of it is whether it's possible to be a priest in the Church of England and still say that you are working class. But um, as for perhaps a slightly different issue, I, I suppose I'm about as middle class as is possible to be. Um, I went to grammar school, my parents university lecturers. Um, I lived in a, a dull suburb of North London. Um, I went to a good university. Um, I read The Guardian, I listened to Bach, et cetera, et cetera. But I've always worked, um, uh, you know, my call to priesthood was, I think, a, a lot of it through a faith in the city. So I've always worked on large working class outer estates and a lot of most of the time in um, unfashionable working class towns. And I suppose I've always seen 
you know, I see that very much as my calling. That's the ministry I enjoy. But I think it's often given me the opportunity. And I, I think working class voices are very hard to hear in the Church of England today. Um, and I think at, at times I've been able to sort of point that out, maybe speak up for some of the more marginalised and forgotten communities in, in places where, where a voice can be heard. Thank you, all of you, for that. The, the conversation has been subtitled this evening, Does the Church Have a Class Problem? And I think there's two facets of this debate we could look at initially. And one is the first is historical and structural. The high proportion of privately educated bishops and those who attended elite universities, which inevitably affects the church's culture and hierarchy. Uh, what are the real life effects of this? And um, Philip, you just mentioned about voices that are quite hard to hear. Is it that those people aren't in the room? Are they just not being listened to? What What is the effect of this structure? I went and uh, did the Yorkshire, th walked the th Yorkshire Three Peaks spontaneously the other Saturday. Um, and I started at Horton, where everyone starts at seven o'clock in the morning when everyone begins. And so the, the paths are really, really busy. And at first I was rather resentful of this, but as I walked on, I realized they were the, weren't the kind of people you normally see walking in mountains. It was younger working class men and women. And I spent the whole day chatting, particularly these large groups of, of, of working class men doing these sponsored walks for friends, you know, hugely committed and really working hard to make money for mates. But I just realized this is a demographic I spend almost no time with. You know, this is this is particularly a white working class. This is a voice that all is almost entirely absent from the church and particularly from its decision making structures. And just, you know, that kind of cultural dissonance just realized the extent to which we do have a big class problem. Um, you know, I, 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 we could go into reasons for that. I suspect one reason at the moment is around uh, a theological ascendancy. So we're going through a time where there's a very, very strong evangelical ascendancy in the Church of England at the moment. It's quite interesting to see where the roots of that ascendancy lay. They lay in three places. The first was the public school and the influence of things like the Bash Camp. The second was the university campus, and that was um, uh, particularly the, the, the University of Christian Union. And the third is, of course, the wealthy town centre church. And that is really the movement that's very much in charge of the Church of England at the moment. It's 95% graduate. And you know, a few years ago, I spoke to the New Wine Conference and said it is critical the evangelicals in this country discover um, a, a real call to serve working class areas and start to bring up leaders from working class backgrounds. But I, th I think that tradition issue is, is quite a powerful one, actually. Does anyone want to pick up on that or another aspect of it? The, there's something about the cultural expectations that the church imposes as well, um, that that somehow we, re, we replicate that culture through our structures and our ways of being. Um, and don't get me wrong, I don't mean that the sort of liturgical and theological ways necessarily. It's about not only the, the people that come forward and uh, allow access, or not, but it's also the expectations we project on other people. So I would be um, saying something about the power that's held um, to allow people, we think we're very hospitable and generous, but inadvertently and sometimes obviously, we, um, we by, by being the very nature of who we are, we can invite and we can exclude by that nature. And we need to be serious about looking at that in detail. Yeah. I'll move on to can the second. I just, oh, yes, of course, Lynn, yes, go ahead. Um, can, can I just say on that question, I think there's something for me in, um, if I can see me, it could be me. And, uh, and at Episcopal level, um, who do we see that we could be? So who do the white working class see that they could be? And, and I, I don't know the answer to that, but I'd suspect it's um, virtually no one. So I think there's that. Um, I think also um, there's um, an issue around narrowness of decision making. That really, really concerns me in Bishop staff teams. 
is if you have a gathering of almost wholly white middle class people making decisions for our diverse communities nationally, I do not see how that can be done from any informed perspective. And I think what we need to do, and this is my thinking, this is broader thinking, but I think what we need to do is really learn how to flip the hierarchy. So the, the greatest diversity in the national church is at parish level, is in our communities and our local churches. How do we take that richness of community capital, all of that, um, that wealth of community information and knowledge and gifts, how do we bring that up into our senior decision-making processes? And I think that's a really interesting challenge for the church. I think it's absolutely crucial that our uh, bishop staff teams reflect the diversity of our communities. This, this... Mm, that's really good. And um, yeah, I just wondered if I might just... Um uh assess that a little bit because often i'm finding that when there's conversation about working class um there's there can be an assumption that we're talking about uh, a white demographic or sort of majority ethnic yeah. demographic and um when i think it's important to you know to as i was coming to uh, to do this broadcast i saw uh, a wonderful working class family of um, a white grandma and a mixed heritage granddaughter and I just think that, you know, um, what, what can happen is it feels like synod or senior leadership can only deal with one issue at a time. Yeah. And it compartmentalizes unhelpfully. Yeah. And so yeah. I don't think it's an either or. OK, let's fix the black issue or let's fix the, work, the, the white, white working class issue. I, I think it's a, it's a both and, and, and. And so I just want to uh, just throw that into, you know, that's something yeah. that I'm wanting to pick yeah. up and promote. I, I, I just wonder if I, I just might just push this a bit further because I think there's a presumption here that the issue the church has with, with social class and, and ministry to working class areas is, is about kind of omission, as if we kind of forget it. I think actually the issue is sometimes worse. I think actually it's sometimes about straightforward hostility. Um, it's, it's, it's sometimes noted the last acceptable form of discrimination is against working class people. And you know, I've been in fora where there's just been simple, straightforward hostility about aspects of working class culture and aspects of working class politics. Um, and I think that lies behind something what Shannon was saying about how, how the environments we feel can appear hostile. And I think it is quite often because they are hostile. Um, I think the issue is a bit more than this is a group of people we've forgotten about. I think there's a real hostility. And I, one area, one example where I've seen that is the really kind of visceral reaction seen by certain sections of the senior hierarchy of the church against Brexit. Now the Brexit vote, there's a lot of working class people voted for Brexit, a lot of people on estates voted for Brexit. We're all familiar with that anywhere, nowhere distinction. And I think, I think the, the kind of quite visceral reaction in certain senior sections of the church towards that vote demonstrated a, a real dislike, I think, in certain places for aspects of working class culture and politics. I think it's a bigger problem that perhaps we're making out. Well, I'm going to come on to some of some of that a bit later on. Uh, first, I'd like to just pick on uh, something that Lynn had said and also had written about, um, which is the second aspect of this about whether the church is, is dominated by a middle class culture. Uh, you've written in, a, in the paper before, Lynn, I'm just going to uh, actually quote you a little bit as we go through, that this is a serious issue that the church is, and you, you said, unhealthily, and I would say sinfully dominated by middle class culture. Could you elaborate on that a little? What what do you call middle class culture in this context? Yeah, can I just go back to to the point that uh, Bishop Phillips just made? Um, the the sinfully dominated. I think it is errors of commission, not omission. In in most cases, um, so I absolutely agree with with what he's just said there. Um, uh, why do I think it's um, uh, dominated by middle class culture, and how is that? evidenced. Um, I, I mean, you, when I published well, um, a blog and then it was picked up by the Church Times in 2019 around is the, is the church dominated by middle class culture, I was absolutely inundated with people up and down the country 
said yes, who said, yes, um, this is my experience. It has been horrendous. Lots of them had kind of um, left church as a result of that. Um, I know that we've had um, similar things on social media with people giving very real life experiences of what it feels like to be marginalized within church structures. And, um, and so I... Yes, I mean, it's a simple yes, no answer. Is the church dominated by a middle class culture? Yes, that's the answer. Um, what It's what we do about that. It's what we do about that that really, um, that, that, that really interests me now and, and how we move forward on that. Is there, is there someone who'd like to just pick up on that and carry on before we move to the next question? Is there another another take on that or anything to add? Or shall I move on? I shall move on. I mean, have things started to change? Does the church lean towards, and Lynn, again, I'm going to quote you as the, as the oracle here, the middle class leader with the heart for the poor. <laughs> Will there ever be, should there ever be, a proudly working class leader sent into a wealthy city church to live out their calling to the downtrodden affluent and show their heart for the rich? We have this very one way system of which way wisdom and, and learning and uh, ministry should go and it does seem to be in, in one direction what 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 is this uh, middle class leader with the heart for the poor is this still the default are things changing and are they changing quickly enough I suppose I am that middle class leader with a heart for the poor. That Lynn precise describes me precisely in that expression. And I'd want to say, actually, probably there's nothing wrong with that at all. And one thing we need is middle class leaders who are prepared to go and work in urban areas and in outer estates. That's absolutely critical. But I think a big part of their job must be to raise up a working class leadership. And that that you know, if if uh, if we're really going to change things, it's about it's got to be about leadership. You know, if you want sustainable urban churches, you need lay leaders in those churches. If you want, um, uh, we really need you know, we need we need leaders from working class backgrounds occupying senior positions. We need, and it, it seems to me that actually it is from the working class of this country that that renewal will come. A middle class church cannot reach beyond middle class areas of the country. Renewal, if you look at the ministry of Jesus, renewal always comes from, from, the, from the places on the edge. If we're really serious about claiming a nation for Christ, then we've got to be really serious about raising up leaders from working class backgrounds. Um, my, my colleague Jill Duff talks about, be, uh, talks about Cageman and Hilda and how the task of Hilda is to spot the Cademans, to, to, to identify, uh, discern, form a working class leadership, people who can speak the gospel in a language that people can understand. I think we have to be careful that we don't get into a kind of language of them and us. And I, I just, I, I, there is something intrinsically difficult for me when we talk about working versus middle class. I think if we are truly to be interdependent, this is about how do we serve? How do we, how do we lay down power? How do some sections of our community, and I mean in terms of our church community, how do we lay down power? How do those in authority realize what it means to, um, to emulate what Christ did? What it means to, to, to seek the wisdom from those who aren't traditionally included to, to actually affirm and encourage that. And so if we, if we start to actually challenge and be really radical about some of these things, yes, I do realize it's problematic that we do have this divide, but wouldn't a church be truly radical if they said those who could would open and allow and support those who are not traditionally included. And therefore, when people look at us, our witness would be, look how they love one another. That for me is something of what we're going to get to, because we will always go around in these circles of defining if we don't get to the bottom of what it means to love one another. Does, does the current conversation feel in some way quite quite top down still there's almost a paternalistic approach to the conversation that means we talk about those on the edge so those who feel that they're in the center talk about those on the edge whereas actually there are already lots of working class 
um, leaders within the within the church who perhaps aren't heard in the same way. How do we how do we change the power dynamic that you've talked about, Sharon? How does that physically start to shift? I think um, uh, something to recognise is that uh, we're being um, as a national church, people are, are watching us and people are seeing things. I remember um, uh, many moons ago now having a conversation uh, where I was trying to share something of faith with uh, with someone who um, was unhoused and they looked at me and said, the day, I'll believe in God the day that I meet a black landowner. And I wasn't expecting that response. I hadn't prepared in my manuals of, of apologetics how to respond if you share something of faith and the person says, I'll believe in God the day that I meet a black landowner. I thought that was interesting that he was um, uh, putting these things together. And I thought, it's something about the class conversation, something about taking up space and, and you know, taking up space in conversations, taking up space in terms of producing resources, taking up space in terms of having the power which comes from um, economic privilege. And, and I, I think how do we work on this? There needs to be uh, some reworking, some reproportioning of, of how people take up space. And I think to your question, Vicky, I think if um, whoever's within an area, if they're able to take up the, the, the right space right. Um, and create space for others, I think we're on the right lines. I don't really understand what that means. Can you give an example about about taking up space so get some sense of what that might mean in terms of practice? Yeah, sure. So I can just think of a number of um, meetings where I've sat in there and often the white middle class male will um, will, will freely um, share and pontificate um, and uh, and the rest of us become the, the box to, uh, to what's happening. Um, uh, I can think of um, of occasions where there's a, a default. So even when, if I've been um, uh, put down as the host or the coordinator of something, um, someone else will will, will will take the the leadership by default, and all of a sudden I'm realising that I'm being marginalised within the space. Um, so it's it's it's, it's along those kinds of lines that, I'm, that I'll find um, that my voice is is minimised and marginalised. And so I, I think there's something about how do we do this? So when I speak with um, uh, black and working class um, people who are thinking about ordination, I'll say to them that the literature, your training will teach you how to be a servant. However, you already know about that. <laughs> and so um, please do make sure that you connect to your history, your story, your heritage, and that you are choosing the time at which you're relinquishing your power as to feeling it's been taken away from you. So I think, you know, that's just part of the rebalancing that I try to do with those that I encounter. Can I, um, can I add in? Um, I, I think something happened a few years ago for me that kind of threw a switch. So I went to a conference and um, there, were, there were three blokes there, uh, white middle-class academics, and they were from um, the inner urban community, Old Trafford in Manchester, where I grew up and I'm from the church that I used to attend, St John's on Ayres Road. And, um, and they were talking about, this was about three or four years ago, they were talking about um, how we needed to support people there and how these people were so poor and deprived and, and all of those kind of things. It was exactly the same narrative that I'd heard 40, 45 years earlier in the parish from the white male middle class academic leaders that were there then. So in 40, 45 years, that um, that church had brought nothing of transformation to that community. That's not to say they hadn't done good, they had done good, but they brought in terms of that magnificent sense of raising up those who are oppressed and poor, that Isaiah 58 sense, that, that that hadn't happened. And and it, the, the issue of indigenous leadership, of, of local working class leaders, is actually key to the transformation of communities. 
So, um, so yes, I don't disagree with Bishop Philip. We do still need middle class leaders with good hearts. We need them to act as gateways, not gatekeepers. So we need them to be a, um, a gateway generation that actually sees that the transformation of our poorer, our deprived, our um, lower income communities relies on the releasing, like Sharon said, that transfer of power, the releasing of power amongst the working class that live there. So I, for me, that's why it's important. Can I ask a practical question then? What would what would help to speed progress in this area? What what could change quickly that would start to not take forty years to show any kind of fruit? So one thing I think it's that, interesting. Um, sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, I think of when I worked in a group of housing estates, uh, some assumptions and mistakes that I made. So we wanted to create a festival for those on the housing estates. And I put a questionnaire together. The first question was, what would you like us to do for this festival? Thankfully, I spoke to someone a bit like you, Lynn, who, um, who just challenged that and said, that is all wrong. Um, you need to ask, what would you like to contribute? And, and that just flipped everything on its head. And so we had um, uh, uh, someone who um, delivered parcels who ended up sleeping poor for the afternoon. We had um, uh, a number of people just getting really involved and sharing their skills and passions, and we enabled that to happen. And for me, that was uh, one of those switch moments when I recognised I came in with assumptions that I'm going to do something to you, for you, as opposed to something with you and facilitating um, you bringing all the goodness that you have to offer. Um I, mean, I, I think there's a degree of kind of romantic theory in some of these conversations as if we're, we're present in working class areas, because, of course, for 30, 40 years, we've been withdrawing church presence. Um, and one of our big issues is that there are so few thriving churches serving working class areas with genuine working class congregations. There's, it, that's that's a really major issue. And if there's church being really serious about planting, there is a high, high, high priority to having real, genuine local churches in urban areas and in working class areas. And unless we're doing that, the whole conversation becomes theoretical. I think that there's also there are some really interesting um uh, exper uh, experiments going on in actually spotting who the working class leaders are, um, who are often there, but being ignored, sidelined, marginalised. Um, so I I'm off later on to uh, the sort of end of year celebration for a course called Empower that we run in, in Blackburn Diocese, where parishes are encouraged to to, to spot their working class leaders, those people who are so often ignored, and where, where they're offered a year of, of really good quality um, formation, building confidence, building faith, building leadership capacity. I think schemes like that can, it could actually have a really significant impact. We can roll those out across the country in terms, yeah, who's coming forward for ordination, but just actually, rather than prophetically, providing high quality leadership for working class communities so that they can, um, uh, 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 some of this stuff we're talking about in terms of sort of re-empowerment can actually be realised. Yeah, I also think that our narrative and the way that we define leadership has to change. We see leadership and, uh, and sort of ability often only in one perspective. And it's a bit as um, Azariah uh, and Bishop Philip was talking about in relation to seeing the gifts that people have, the, the needful gifts for us as a church to be uh, all that we can be and that we are actually missing something. And until we kind of uh, adopt that posture of humility to see actually we need this as much and it isn't about us defining or imposing on people um and you know most of our ministry has been uh, spent in outer estates or inner city estates and i have been incredibly blessed by the folks um as we have ministered together in that place and there is something about being completely explicit about the gifts in that area and how we intentionally proactively look out and discern for leadership. Lynn, um, in her writing, tells a beautiful story of a young woman who came to someone, her um, local church pastor, and forgive me, Lynn, if I get this wrong, who, who didn't look 
typically like the person, but who was later um, affirmed in that ministry by somebody else, wasn't by that particular individual. So we need people who are open to recognising, celebrating and affirming the gifts that others bring. Can I also add, Vicky, um, some, um, we, we've got to be careful, I think, of um, hypothesizing or, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of contemplating this and not actually um, changing the, the systems and the structures that will create the change over time. I think that's what happened. Faith in the city, brilliant. We got the Church Urban Fund. There was lots of momentum. There was lots of goodwill. But actually, the church didn't look at itself. It didn't remove the log from its own eye before it tried to go and remove the splinter elsewhere. And that's where we've got to start now. All of these stories, all of this narrative that's coming out, I, I'm really pleased that people feel able to come forward and share some of their experiences. That kind of lobbying um, needs to continue. We need to keep hearing what is happening on the ground in our communities, what is happening to our working class leaders. We need to continue to hear that. But alongside that, we need to continue to influence a structural and systemic change. So you asked what would progress this? So that there are a few things there that I think are going to be game changers over time. So the new qualities for selection are, um, are qualities rather than criteria and have been drawn up to allow a broader range of candidates to evidence against them. The other thing that I'm absolutely delighted about in that is this document. Those are socio-economic background questions uh, that are going to go um, to Bishop's advisory panels for the first time from September 2021 onwards. Socio-economic background questions are going to be asked and they are really good. They really get under the skin of um, the, all that flakiness around how do we define class. Um, it goes into did you get a bursary to go to school? Um, were you on free school meals? Um, what job exactly did your, your parents do? All of these kind of it's really, really good. Um, if we, um, it, it's a sad thing, but it's true. What's measured gets done. And once we start to accumulate data on socioeconomic background, and once we start to look at who's going forward into senior leadership, who's being taken on to the senior leadership development program, who's going through the Episcopal exploration process, um, what are their backgrounds, then we begin to be able to really tighten the screw. And there's a lot of goodwill on this that, you know, most of the church, I think, is going with us on this, which is great. But really, really, we mustn't let up until this job is done. Um, so, uh, so that's what will progress it, I think. I'm, I'm going to move on to some of the uh, comments that are um, appearing from people watching, but I, I want to just follow up on what you've all said about this and ask whether whether this can happen without some who already have power being prepared to give it up and to pass it on in order to see a more representative church. How do you see that going? Sharon, could I ask you first? If I'm honest, Vicky, we have such a naive understanding of power. I hear so many people say, I don't have it, I can't do anything. And it's so frustrating to hear that. And, and for, for, for us as disciples, it literally means giving it up and stepping back. It, it means actually saying, where are the places that, are, that require my sisters and brothers to be alongside, to contribute, it's about equity and equity recognizes that this is not a level playing field and therefore we have to change structurally and we have to be committed to give up and so i would be suggesting the power of influence the power to make incremental changes and substantive changes the power to speak um, and advocate for they're all within our grasps, individually, collectively, as senior colleagues. We can do this. We have to have the will to see the change. 
Would anybody else like to comment on that? I'd like to comment on um, something that Lynn, that Lynn said about the qualities and the selection process, if that's all right, or it, which it, it is very exciting, but it comes to the power issue again. Where does actually the power lie in that whole process? Um, who are the gatekeepers? You know, that, that, that new selection process is going to be only as good as those who diocese are um, sponsoring for ordination. The gatekeepers can often sit further back. So actually, it, it, a new set of qualities is a start. We now need a, a, you know, a, a, a change culture within the Church of England, which is prepared to give away power to those traditionally disempowered. Without that, it's just a piece of paper. And that was my question. Do you, do you see that happening? And, and what, who would have to do that? And, and what process would that involve? And because the, the, the issue is, it also comes back to charity. The, the way, the way, the reason many people in the church don't think they hold power is because the power is so diffuse and so unaccountable in the Church of England that it's almost very hard, it's hard to work out where it lies. And that the, the vocations process is one of those actually. You know, who, where are the gates being thrown shut? To people from working class backgrounds in that system it's quite hard to work it out there's no doubt at all that a big place was the BAP which feels like going to prep school for three days now that I think has been very successfully sorted out we need to go on looking at where those other gates are I think there's there's one angle that we haven't touched on in in any detail particularly here is that there is sometimes um the conflation of working class with white uh, the, the news report recently about white working class boys that was seized on in the wider media. Um, but but we know there are um, intersecting isms, you know, classism, racism, sexism, for example, that can have a compounding effect. Uh, and I would imagine that those who are living with all of those things are very aware of where power is perceived to lie. Uh, rather than people who perhaps say, well, I, I don't know where power lies in this structure. Would anyone like to expand a little bit on on those kind of intersectional aspects? Well, I think I um, I touched on it in my open gambit in terms of um, uh, the uh, the desire of a conversation I was having that had gone to the right schools, you know, and this sense of I, I to some degree was part of a particular club um, and uh, I, I think um, I think there's a, a recent uh, racial disparity report uh, which came out um, from the government and it looked at that and, and said uh, that institutional racism wasn't taking place um, uh, in the UK that much and and it began to just sort of break things down in what I found in a very unhelpful way. And it did a, a compare and contrast. And so what that tends to do, it tends to break people apart and divide us. And actually, I think we need much more of a coalition of those who have been disadvantaged and disenfranchised within our society. Um, we need a, a type of poor people's campaign uh, and that sense of, of coalition uh, to, to, to work together as opposed to what often happens that we're atomized and compartmentalized and actually all the power begins to, to, to diffuse and dilute. And the worst thing that can happen is that people begin to feel competitiveness or rivalry against one another and, 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 those, who, um, and, and those who hold the power, it doesn't really affect them to the same degree. Mm -hmm. Can I just add... Uh... Oh, sorry, Sharon, that, after you. No, no, after you, Lynn. That's all right. No, I was just going to say, I, I think we power isn't something that they hold. Um, it's not a them and us, which uh, I think um, and I think um, Sharon and Azariah have both kind of touched on um, uh, separately. Um, so I think we each need to check our own privilege all the time. So when I was asked to do this seminar tonight, I said, who else is on the panel? when I've just been asked to do something else, I said, who else is going to be involved? And, and so it may be us that are acting as, as gatekeepers. You know, I'm very, well, I've stood aside on quite a lot of stuff I'm on because, you know, they've heard enough from me. So, um, so let's get some fresh voices in. Let's, let's spread that, um, that, that power base and, and others 
filter through. So I think it's about each of us, a bit like we have all member ministry. I think it's about each of us uh, um, look at checking our own privilege in everything that we're offered and saying who else is involved, because that way you don't turn up and have an all male panel or an all white panel or a, because you, you're you there, at the, you have power in that situation to affect the outcome. And, and some of these issues um, are really, really helpfully discussed by Al Barrett and Ruth Harley in their book, Being Interrupted. So if, you, if you're interested in those kind of issues around intersectionality, they're really sensitively and, and handled with a great nuance in that book. So I would really recommend that for anybody who wants to read further on this. Yeah, yeah I, I endorse that as well. I think what we have to develop is a much more sophisticated understanding of multiple um, oppressions and inequalities that people experience as a church. If we, if we are going to be able to uh, understand what God is saying to us through them and through those individuals that experience them as well. So there's something about an intentionality, as you know, my colleagues have just been said, about everything we do. So, you know, right from a parish level, right in terms of the way that we worship to make sure everyone is included and to not, not just a visual superficial representation, but true participation and the way that we go out um, of our way to make sure that that happens. And as I said earlier, it means for some of us standing back, it means um, giving up. Uh, and until we start to ask the question, who's missing? We will not see the progress we hope to, to see. Thank you. Well, I'm going to move on to some of the comments now. And rather than post specific comments, because there are some that uh, cover the same themes, I'm going to summarise. Uh, one that has come up a couple of times is the driving away of poorer working class people by charging exorbitant fees for the occasional offices that people can't afford. Is there something around that that the church could do? Yes, it could stop charging fees for, for weddings and funerals. Um, uh, and I, you know, I think I think that's a very fair point because I think we, you know, we've lost one of our big connections, the working class communities, by renouncing um, occasional offices. Um, uh, uh, there was a good rebellion in Synod a few years ago, which almost worked, which would have led to the ab abolition of the fees table. Um, uh, some experimentation was promised on that, which never quite happened. But it, but I think that's a strong point that one. Anyone have another another take on that, or is that a, a fairly unanimously felt view? <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm going to pick up on another comment. Um, uh, we don't need to raise up a working class leadership. We need to recognise working class leaders. We working class leaders are sitting in the C of E's congregations, not on the edge. How does that How does that start? Is it already happening? What What's the encouragement or the agreement that you'd want to offer someone making that comment? Um, I think... Um, yeah, I, I think I'll say something about um, uh, head, heart and hand. So I think sometimes we're, we're so cerebral in terms of how we we engage and things become very abstract and theoretical. So I think um, we need to, to get out of our heads in terms of categories and this sort of thing and actually have friendships, um, human to human relationships with people um, across different um, uh, uh, class boundaries or, or what have you that, that are there. And um, in terms of heart, I think um, on the theme of friendship, where do we, admit people into our our personal sphere, maybe not our private sphere, but our personal sphere, so that we do things together, and whether it's that we listen to Bach together, or whether it's we, we do roller derby together, or we go to the cinema together, but where do we do things um, together in order to share one another's stories, um, where there isn't this uh, 
a sort of a, a structured hierarchy for our interactions. And, and then hands, where do we put our bodies? Where are we? And how can we be um, uh, together more and to, to gather um, more? And so, yeah, that, that's, uh, that's something I'm thinking of in this. Friendship. Uh, there's a question that's come up, which may feed into what you've just said, Azariah, actually. What, what role do worker priests and ministers secular employment have in working alongside working class people in, in workplaces and in communities? Is that something you think the church has given enough consideration to? Well, actually, I, um, I don't know if it was a week or two ago, I saw something of Archbishop Justin Welby on his sabbatical, and he was a big issue seller for the day. I don't know if you saw that, that new story. But I, I really like that. I love the fact in that he, um, you know, he chose to, um, to spend time with this person and learn with and from um, this big issue seller. He seemed to be... Um, you know, somebody who's making a, a real impact in terms of ministering to those um, who are buying the issue from him and, and the wider area. And I, I, I think that um, uh, uh, having a, a day in the life or, or, or longer can just help to bridge that empathy and, and can help us to, to understand things through others' eyes. So I would really encourage our practice of, of walking in someone else's shoes. Can I, can I add um, something on that as well? Um, I'd, I would echo what Azariah said about friendship. I think um, building relationships and greater understanding is is absolutely um, crucial. But um, but but sometimes um, middle class clergy, particularly and church leaders, uh, just fail to recognise um, leadership qualities. Um, I think sometimes they look for kind of management qualities um, and um, leadership qualities um, can be, you know, somebody giving time to the governing body at school or it can be somebody giving time to um, residents association or whatever. So I think it's uh, I think it's a real issue about people not being recognised as potential leaders. And I think that's where we... Um, where, where kind of the congregation element needs to come in um because i was at an necn conference many many years ago in london and and the question was asked is estates leadership to middle class and a, a middle class um lay leader from from an estate who didn't live in the area but came in um said well of course um the working class need the middle class to lead them and um and i think that is moving on but I think there's kind of a body, there's kind of a, a, an overall lack of class confidence that um, they kind of, um, there's a kind of a, a lack of confidence that the working class kind of are able to um, manage, lead. And, and in fact, in working class communities, you have some of the most creative, resilient, gifted, resourceful um, people with the richest gifts. Um, you know, my gran used to say, necessity is the mother of invention. And when you've not got a lot, you've got to make what you can with what you've got. And so, um, so you know, I, I just think that is a real, I, I think that that question that's been asked is absolutely crucial. I think we need to think about that. And how do we give greater awareness to those um, gatekeepers who may at the moment be acting um, uh, not as gateways as we'd want them to, really. And this kind of change of emphasis, I think, it, it, it does mean a great looking very intently at what we're doing in terms of ministry in, in, in working class areas. You know, so much energy in the church at the moment goes towards the food bank and towards other service provider provision which may have a role to play and may be important. But actually, when you talk, when you listen to working class communities about the food bank, lots of people will say, why are they dependent on food banks? The people should be standing on their own two feet. It's not a model that empowers people. I mean, I think we need to move away from service provision towards actually um, identifying leadership in the way that Lynn is describing, um, uh, um, which is a, a very different model, but a much, much more exciting model. But of course, the service provider model is a nice convenient one because power lies in the hands of those in charge. It's, it doesn't, doesn't in degree, involve nearly the same degree of risk. And I'd love to see us 
moving away from our kind of addiction to that kind of service provider model towards doing something rather more dangerous and edgy in urban areas. Yeah. Well, we have. Also, oh, sorry, sorry, Sharon. Go on. Just very quickly, it's also about asking the questions about why. Why are people in those situations? And I think, in terms of some of the uh, political and social activism that goes on, again, often instigated by people in those areas. Uh, you know, coming. My my father was a shop steward. We were taught, and we uh, understood what it meant to. Um, to keep uh, challenging why things were the way they were. And I, and I think you get a lot of that going on. So again, it's about the assets that are there. Yeah, and if absolutely. you look at things in a different way, we will see the leadership that's already there. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Absolutely. And I think um, I'm just remembering uh, a kind of a painful memory of a parish I was part of where we had a very um, thriving uh, toddler, parent and toddler group. But then um, uh, there was a new regime at the church and the first thing they did was to shut it down. And so the local parents from this uh, group of housing estates said, we'd love to continue it. We're happy and willing to give our time to continue this. But the message was, actually, we've got other plans for what we're going to do. Um, so. Thank you very much. And, you know, and that was the, the disbanding of something. Wonderful leaders, wonderful, rich uh, ministry and, and life and being shared there, which was uh, without any listening, was just overrun and overruled. We are in our last five minutes. There are lots of um, really relevant comments that um, we don't really have time to dig into at the moment, I'm afraid. The working class do not have leaders. We have loyalties. That would be... A, really interesting one to discuss uh, and move towards a community organising model rather than service provision. These are all things that could be uh, whole discussions in and of themselves. So thank you to everyone in the comments who has shared some really helpful and thought provoking um, bits. It hasn't, it hasn't gone ignored. It's definitely informed what we've talked about here. So thank you. And to wrap up, I'd just like to ask each of the panel, what's, what's the one thing you'd like to see change predominantly in this area, if there was one thing um, that you think could fundamentally make a difference, you know, if we were to have this conversation a year from now, that you think could actually have, have made a difference and how could that change start to happen? Sharon, could I start with you? I guess very simply, uh, participation. Um, Lynn said something about uh, if we see what we could be, not just for me it's not just about seeing but those individuals from a, a variety of background being the shapers and the formers of what we will become in the future as well lynn um i I was with somebody the other day who said diversity in organizations is a superpower. And um, I, I think if we could embrace that in our leadership and in our episcopate, I think we'd have a radically different church. And um, I think if we could, um, if, if we could uh, bring in that richness that, that everyone has talked about at parish level, in our lower income communities, in our working class communities, into the church, that would be enormously missional, uh, enormously missional, because people would see a church that was relevant, that spoke with their frames of reference, that spoke into issues that they have. And nationally, who is speaking up at a leadership level for the working class identity, not just in the church, but nationally? because the working class identity is in danger of being manipulated politically. And, we, and so I think the church has a role here. I think it has a prophetic role in stepping up in terms of working class leadership generally. So um, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see a really positive embracing of diversity and not broken down as Azariah said, not, oh, this is an issue um, for people of colour, this is an issue of class, this is, and then having to, you know, kind of vie against each other. It's it's an issue. Diversity is our superpower in the church. Azariah, would you like to follow on from that? 
sure. Um, to say that there was a, a medieval practice called uh, the Feast of Fools, where there was a complete inversion. So those in the church who had power, um, they uh, power was taken away, and um, and uh, the children and 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 those who were um, part of the villages and this sort of thing, they were were elevated to the decision making power, and there was a festival, a carnival, a parade to demonstrate that inversion that you were talking about earlier, Lynn, the Magnificat. And so I think I'd love to see how we could tap into the philosophy of the Feast of Fools. Mm. Great. Um, Philip? Presence, I think, you know, I, I fear this whole conversation could be pretty theoretical in 10, 15 years' time, um, uh, because we, there will not be Christian presence in large numbers of working class communities. We've already got 350 estates around, the large estates around the country where there's no Christian presence at all. Um, and I can only see that getting worse with many dioceses planning to reorganize. Uh, some of those moving things I've seen in the last few years are new church plants on urban estates where everything you're describing is happening in abundance, where leaders are being raised up, where there's wonderful service, where, you know, where worship is a real taste of the kingdom. And that it's that kind of re-energized evangelistic joy on our urban estates that will actually change everything. So a, a fresh commitment to presence in the areas that we're in danger of leaving behind. Thank you all again. I'm just uh, looking through the, the comments as we finish. And um, one says that it should be all about love because we have an abundance of it and we shouldn't substitute it with anything else. And I think everything you said this evening, all of you has really had that at the core. So thank you um, all for bringing your wisdom to that. I think it's been a really fruitful, helpful conversation that has challenged, but also really edified a lot of people listening. So thank you. Um, and thank you to everyone who has been watching and contributing from home. Um, thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Bye bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.